There's a story they tell in the canon, the time of a previous Buddha, who had a very talented student. His name was Apipu. He had very strong psychic powers. And one day the Buddha, at that time, turned to a student and said, Let's go to the Brahma field, <coughs> Brahma world before lunch. Like, Let's zip down to Escondido before lunch. So I zipped up to the Brahma world. And then Apipu started teaching the Dhamma. And the Brahmas were upset. So why is the student teaching us? Why don't we have the teacher teaching us? And the Buddha said, well, the student is talented. And so Apipu would disappear and then reappear. Then the upper half of his body would disappear, but the lower half of his body would appear, and then vice versa. So after he'd showed off his powers, then the Brahmas were willing to listen. And the Buddha said, Tell people, make your voice so that the whole universe can hear it. As so we thought for a bit about what, what to say to the whole universe, it was basically exert yourself, strive, commit yourself to the practice. Crush your defilements as an elephant would crush a house made out of reeds. It's interesting that that would be the message for the whole universe. Strive, exert, commit. Because if anything is going to be accomplished in this life, it has to come through effort. The end of suffering. It was also through effort, and it's through through suffering, a difficult practice sometimes, that you do get released from suffering. We don't like to hear this, but it's a message for the whole universe, that if you don't put forth an effort, you're just going to be riding on your past efforts, and after a while they're going to run out. So you have to look at yourself, what do I have to deal with right now? What kind of effort is appropriate? The Buddha, of course, defines four kinds of right effort. You can work on preventing unskillful thoughts from arising. Or if they have arisen, you can work on abandoning them. As for skillful thoughts, skillful mental qualities, if they're not there, try to give rise to them. And if they're already there, try to maintain them. Our problem is that we tend to sit with our unskillful thoughts. They're okay, and yet they're creating a lot of trouble for ourselves and for the people around us. And if for some reason we feel that, well, this is simply the way I am, that attitude, the Buddha said, blocks the path. Because you're basically denying that you can change, and that it's worth the effort to change. Yet he said the whole reason he taught was because it is worth the effort to change, and it can be done. You can give rise to skillful ways of thinking to replace your unskillful ones. The first thing, of course, is to recognize your unskillful thoughts as unskillful thoughts. Here again, the attitude, well, this is the way I see things. If the way you see things were right, you wouldn't have any defilements. You have, wouldn't have any suffering. So as long as you're suffering, you're not seeing things right. So this is one of the reasons why we work with perceptions in our, in our meditation. The Buddha talks about calming bodily fabrication and calming mental fabrication. Calming bodily fabrication requires basically calming the way you breathe. And calming the way you breathe, you begin to realize it's going to depend on how you perceive the breath energy in the body. What are the images you use? Which images are, are useful? And John Lee gives a series in his Seven Steps. But then you look at his Dharma talks, and he has lots of other ways of perceiving the, the breath energy. So there's no one 
right way of looking at the breath energy. But there are ways that are right for specific problems. That's part of your repertoire as a meditator. And then he says calm mental fabrication, that basically calming your perceptions. For the purpose of meditation, you're trying to perceive pain in a way that it doesn't impinge on you, that it doesn't form a block. But sometimes even before you can settle down in concentration, you've got to change your perceptions about, about your daily life, the people you associate with. And you have to learn how to question them, the perceptions. Because if you're carrying them into your attitude right now, they're going to get in the way. You think about what this person did or what that person did, or this person means ill to you, that person means ill to you. And it's a reason to dismiss them. But that just stirs up the mind. You have to ask yourself, maybe I'm perceiving things wrong. What would it have? more accurate way of perceiving things be? What would be a more useful way of perceiving things? What would be more conducive to getting the mind to settle down? Because remember, we're doing all of this in the context of the Four Noble Truths. And the Four Noble Truths basically say the reason you're suffering is because of actions coming from within. And those actions are perceptions, feelings, intentions, ways of paying attention. So you've got to be willing to question them. Because otherwise you're just going to hold on and nothing's going to happen. You can get great states of concentration. But they can begin to chip away at your solid attitudes. John Fuhring had a student who was very talented in concentration. She could settle down, get her mind quiet really quickly, very firmly. But it was concentration without discernment. She actually needed somebody there to remind her to come out. Her mind was so blank when it got into concentration, so unthinking. And she complained to John for and she said, I don't see how my meditation is helping me in my daily life. Sometimes my anger seems to be worse. Well, it was because she had compartmentalized things. There was the concentration practice, and then when she left it, she left it totally. You have to be willing to take the lessons from the meditation and apply them to your daily life. And one of the lessons you've got to learn is if your perceptions are causing suffering, you've got to change your perceptions, no matter how real they may seem, no matter how true they may seem. They're not what you want, because you're trying to find a perception that helps put an end to suffering, or perceptions that put an end to suffering. So we talk about seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, but it really does require a radical reordering of the way you think and the way you act. What you see is important, what you see is worth putting aside. And your sense of what's really going on is what I said, inappropriate attention looks at the same things as appropriate attention, but it focuses on different details. The details may be true, but they're not helpful. You've got to look for things that are true and beneficial and timely. Remember the Buddha's standards for what would be a right speech, the kind of speech that he would say. It had to be true, and then it had to be beneficial. It was true, but it was not beneficial. He'd put it aside. He wouldn't say it. But if it's true and beneficial, then the next question is, is this the right time and place for that? And if it didn't pass that test, then put that aside too. What's interesting is that when he goes through the different permutations of these questions, the idea that something could be false but beneficial is, was not even entertained. But notice also there are a lot of true things that he put aside, or things that at least seem true. If it's not beneficial, why bother? And it's not worth 
speaking, but it's not even worth thinking. So you really strive in the practice, it really does seriously mean you've got to change the way you look at things. You've got to change your sense of reality. Come at it with a different set of questions. And the questions are, where is the suffering here? What's causing the suffering? What can be done to abandon the cause? What can be done to comprehend the suffering? So you can realize the cessation. As Buddha said, you've got to develop the factors of the path, which include right view. An important part of right view is, is goodwill. There's one place where the Buddha actually says, if you have ill will for other people, that's wrong view. If you think anything is served by ill will, that's wrong view. And look at the part of the mind that resists change. Because if it resists the Dharma, it's a defilement. No matter how insistent it is that it's right. In fact, the really resistant thoughts, those are the those are the hard shelled defilements. You've got to learn how to crack somehow. So that message is Abhipu. Strive. Exert yourself. Commit yourself to the practice. That's his message to the universe. And it, where were we at that time? Apparently we could, we could have heard it or someplace in the universe. But we let it go past. You have to ask yourself, how many more aeons are you going to let this message go past? And how much more suffering are you going to create in the meantime? And look for the part of the mind that says, you've had enough. It's time to change. That's a skillful intention, and you don't want it just to arise and pass away. You want it to be the beginning of something good.